We've been discussing Revelations 777. That is the seven churches, the seven seals, and the seven trumpets. And we've been through the seven churches, starting with Ephesus, going through Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, we're going to be looking at the seven seals and then the seven trumpets. And what we're going to see is that the one overlaps the other, or the one is a a depiction of the other in a form of recapitulation as we explained. Now, as it goes, when you travel, you meet up with various people and you meet up with various cultures. And I've been told and explained to by my colleagues here in Australia that it's not Laodicea, it's Laodicea. And it's not uh, uh, the Nicolaitans, it's the Nicolaitans or the Nicolaitans. Not only that, it's not Job, it's Job. So from now on I'm going to try and speak Australian and not English, I mean not South African. Let's continue on with the seven seals. We look into the word of God, we look into Revelation and we see this idea of a scroll that is locked with seven seals. Now what is a seal? A seal is maybe something that a king would have used his signet ring on to either seal a document, to lock up, um, like the tomb was sealed with the Roman insignia. Daniel, when he was locked in the lion's den, his tomb was sealed up with the signet ring of the, of the king. So here is a scroll locked up with seven seals, and a seal can only be unlocked by the power that sealed it or a power higher than the power that sealed it. So what is this about seven seals? Who are they? What are they? How does it all fit together? Well, let's look at it. We're going to see some interesting depictions here about horsemen, about horses, certain aspects which at first glance seem quite confusing. Let's read it together from Revelation 5 verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Verse 2. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. John is disturbed because he's not able to get to see inside this. And he's weeping because he can't know, he's not allowed to know what's going on inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And we have this image now of Jesus Christ being the only person who who has the authority to break the seal. Revelation 6 verse 1 reads as follows. Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked and behold, this is the first horse. I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. Do you remember the first seal or the first time slot of the first church Ephesus? That was from the time of Christ up to approximately 100 AD. That was a powerful, pure faith that went out into the world. It was a faith based on the foundations that Christ had left. In the same way, the first seal is a powerful, white, pure horse with a horseman on it, with a bow sending out this information, this true gospel into the world. If we look at the seven churches, you've got the same thing, this clean truth going into the world. If you look at the seven seals, you've got this clean message going into the world. We now move from Ephesus to Smyrna. We move from the first seal to the second seal. Do you remember the second time period was from 100 onwards to about 313 AD? Well, let's look at this. This is, interestingly enough, a red horse. This is seal two that's broken and a horse with the color red. Do you remember? It's got to do with persecution. That comes out of the second seal. Let's read it together from Revelation 6 verse 4. Another horse fiery red went out and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another 
and there was given to him a great sword. You see how this time in the recapitulation style, the Lord explains that people will be killing one another and it will be a time of persecution. And in history, that's exactly what history tells us. This is the time that Christians were persecuted. The first time in history it hadn't reached such a stage before. And Jesus, in his prophetic eyes, explaining to John what's going to be taken, taking place and how the Christians will be thrown in front of the lions in these amphitheater-style, horrendous, sporting in situations. It's a red horse, and it goes out into the world. Seal number three. This is interesting. It's a black horse, a dark horse. And... The third time period, if you'll remember, it was first Ephesus to Smyrna, then Smyrna, and the third church was Pergamum. You remember that? That was from 313 onwards. This is a compromised faith. This is where the faith goes out into the world with certain limps about it. It's not quite the pure faith anymore. Let's read it together from Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say come and see so i looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand you see they're trying to compromise which way is it what should i what should i include what should i exclude the fourth seal do you remember the period of that we closes off in 538 and goes up into the mid 1600s or mid 1500s 1600s approximately this is the pale horse this is the time when this Almost a doctrine of death goes into the world, a skeletal figure of a, a type of spirituality, Christian way of life that doesn't have any flesh on it. Let's read it together from Revelation 6 verse 8. So I looked and behold a pale horse, and the name who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed him. This is now the period from Pergamum to Thyatira. Anybody who studied in history the effect that uh, the church had or the, the experiences that they had during this period, what's called the Dark Ages. Why was it called the Dark Ages? Well, we are told in the word that Jesus is the light of the world. It says also, thy word is a lamp. And there was a power that covered up the light as much as possible and blocked people from receiving the word. And that's why this entire period is called the Dark Ages. Thyatira is symbolized in history and through time as well as the period that was uh, the, the Waldenses and the Albigenses were persecuted for believing what they believed. Verse 8 says the following, And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. This was the first time in history that a union took place between church and state. This had never been seen before and these people that fled from this persecuting power fled into the hills and into the valleys. Some into the hills of, and the mountains of France, others even across the world. Some came to South Africa called the Huguenots today. We know it from South African history. This image is an image at the Huguenot Museum in the southern, southern area of South Africa where this woman is depicted standing on the earth fleeing in a moment as she's running away in her right hand she's holding the bible and in her left she's holding a broken chain she's broken away from the persecuting power of the combination of church and state the fifth seal opens in revelation 6 verse 9 it reads as follows when he opened the fifth seal when Jesus opened, in other words, the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they had maintained. This historically is the period from 538 up to the 1600s and then onwards. Now we're talking about Sardis from the 1600s onwards. Do you remember when that was? What took place around that time? The Reformation, right? Revelation 6 verse 10 reads the following. And they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. 
Very difficult message to understand if, if you don't understand the concept or the context that these are time periods. Our brethren that stood in the Reformation as Protestants and people that protested against this church union with state, the persecuting power, they were killed in their millions. And we'll be going into that in a later lecture. They stood and they said, the Bible and the Bible alone. And it was given to them, they must have really begged, Lord, why can you not put an end to this? No matter how much they called, it had already been given to them in Revelation, in Scripture, to be able to say, but it is written, the Lord cannot come yet. Because it says in Revelation 6 verse 11, they have to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. So the persecution that took place in the previous era was going to take place in the, same, in the next era as well. These were people that stood on their faith and were willing to die if it was being compromised. The sixth seal is then opened in Revelation 6 verses 12 and 13. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair, while the whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. This period, historically and lining up with the seven churches, is a period of called Philadelphia. This is the 1700s up to and including the period of 1844. Interestingly enough, it's the only time or up to this point where the Lord speaks about specific happenings, about the sun and the moon and certain physical or planetary things taking place. It was supposedly during that period that the sun would go dark and the moon would go red. Well, I tell you what, let's go and look again outside the Bible because now we know what the Bible says. Let's look, what does history tell us about that period? And you can go to any book, you can go to any history book. But I suggest we go for just for today's lecture into a book called The Great Events of the Past Century. This is a stock standard history book that describes a certain events of the period uh, that we're busy discussing at the moment. Interestingly enough, when you get there, section 3 or chapter 3 will tell you about a wonderful dark day of 17. What is the period that we're busy with at the moment? Do you remember? It's from the 1700s up to and including approximately 1844. Do you remember that? Right. This dark day happened on May 19 of 1780. Let's read about it. It says there, This darkness was not caused by an eclipse. And it's manifest by various positions of planetary bodies at the time, for the moon was more than 150 degrees from the sun all that day. And according to accurate calculations made by most celebrated astronomers, there could not, in order of nature, be any transit of the planet Venus or Mercury upon the disk of the sun that year. Nor could it have been a blazing star, much less a mountain that darkened the atmosphere. For this would still leave unexplained the deep darkness of the following night. Nor would such extensive nocturnal darkness follow an eclipse of the sun. And as to the moon, she was at that time more than 40 hours motion past her opposition. Here was a day on, on, on the uh, 19th of May in 1780 where for no astro astronomical reason, for no reason, planetary, the sun went dark. You see, the Bible had said that during this period, there'll be certain signs in the earth and this and that and that will happen. And according to the schedule, clockwork on time, bang, the sun goes dark. Revelation 60, 6 verse 12 says, the whole moon turned blood red. So number one, the sun has to turn dark like sackcloth. And number two, the whole moon has to turn, sun, has to turn red. Well, it continues in verse 12 and 13 and says the following. Not only does it turn, turn, the moon turn red, but it says, And the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Here's some or other planetary happening again or some, some happening in the heavens, the stars that are falling from heaven as if a, a fig tree has, was being shaken by a strong wind. 
We go back into the same history book or any other one, and you have a look at the, what's called the sublime meteor shower all over the United States when? 1833. Right in before the 1844 mark. Fulfillment of prophecy? Well, let's read what actually happened. The most grand and brilliant celestial phenomenon ever beheld and recorded by man. It speaks about stars that are being flung at the earth from one central source. If we were to lie on the grass at night and we were to look up at the stars and we were to wonder about uh, if we would see a shooting star, we might see one go past over there and then we'll see another one come across and then maybe one going this way. This occurrence was one central source and from the source thousands upon thousands upon thousands of stars or some sort of meteorite or meteor was flashing through the sky. Read this with me. See what they say. Extensive and magnificent showers of shooting stars have been known to occur in various places in modern times. But the most universal and wonderful which has ever been recorded is that of the 13th of November, 1833. The whole firmament over all the United States being then for hours in fiery commotion. No celestial phenomenon has ever occurred in this country since its first settlement, which was viewed with such intense admiration by one class in the community or with so much dread and alarm by another. See, one class was waiting for this to happen. These people said, wow, this is fantastic. The Bible prophecies are being fulfilled. Another group of people said, oh, the sky is falling on our head. What are we going to do? See, if you don't have the word of God as your anchor, you get thrown around by things that are happening around you. Let's read on. It was the all-engrossing theme of conversation and of scientific disquisition for weeks and months. Indeed, it could be no otherwise than that such a rare phenomenon, next in grandeur and sublimity to that of a total solar eclipse or of a great comet stretched outward and starry heavens in full view and wonder-struck universe, that should awaken the deepest interest among all beholding it. Nor is the memory of this marvelous scene yet extinct. Its sublimity and awful beauty still linger in many minds who will also remember well with the error of the demonstration with which it was regarded, the mortal fear that was excited among many people. It is said that Arago computes that not less than 240,000 meteors were at the same time visible above the horizon of Boston. Imagine you standing looking at the horizon of Boston and at one time, 240, over 240,000 meteors are seen at the same time. That would pretty much catch your eye. It says, To form some idea of such a spectacle, one must imagine a constant succession of fireballs resembling skyrockets radiating in all directions from a point in the heaven near the zenith and following the arch of the sky towards the horizon. Spot on that clockwork. The Lord says, The sky is going to go dark. That happens in 1780. He also says the moon's going to go red and the sky is going to be filled with these falling stars. Fulfillment of prophecy? Absolutely. This day will be remembered and has been recorded in history books all over the world. Revelation 6.14 continues. This is now the next scroll. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Do you remember the next period? Laodicea, according to my Australian colleagues, or Laodicea, Laodicea. This is from 1844 onwards until the time of Christ. And the Bible explains that when Christ arrives to fetch his own, the skies will recede like a scroll. They will be curled up like a scroll. And this day of Jesus coming to fetch his own is the most magnificent day that's waiting for all of us. Revelation 6 verse 15 says the following. Then the kings of the earth and the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. You would think that these people would be excited of Jesus coming. But it says the generals and the rich and the princes and the mighty, they all hid amongst the, the caves and the rocks of the mountains. Verse 16. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. 
for the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? You see, when Jesus comes, brothers and sisters, when he comes to fetch his own, there are going to be certain things that take place on that day that have never happened in the history of mankind. We're going to discuss these later on, but boy, is that going to be a day. Revelation 7 verse 4. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about half an hour. Now this 144,000 causes, is a bit of a bone of contention about, amongst some people. Some people say it's a literal 144,000. Others say, well, it's just some figure. Well, when the Bible gives you information, you know, remember we said any additional information makes you, is calling you to sit up and take notice. Probably one of the most important things to do when studying the Bible is to do theme studies. This is when you study the Bible on a topic from start to finish that you can understand what the entire Bible says. If you read this one quotation or one text in Revelation 7 verse 4, then boom, 144,000 it'll have to be. That's not really the case though, because the tribes, it says 12,000 from each tribe. And when you go and list the tribes, you see it's not the full 12 tribes and there's certain things that are missing, etc. The study of this 144,000 becomes, it, when you do the study, it becomes very clear that it's not a literal 144,000 people. The number 12 is the number of enough, sufficiency. The Lord called 12 apostles. That was enough for him to ensure that his message would encircle the globe. 12 is a number of magnitude or mightiness or, or fullness. So 12 times 12 is fullness times fullness. Or even 144,000, which would be 12,000 by 12,000, would be a descriptive figure of the fullness of the number that was decided upon by God. Matthew 24 verse 20 says the following. At that time the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds and one, from one end of the heavens to the other. When Jesus comes, the, the heavens will roll up like a scroll and the angels and Jesus riding with them will be seen by every single person. There we have the seven churches from the time of Christ to the end of time. Now we've seen the seven scrolls from the time of Christ till his second return or his second coming. Let's move now into the seven trumpets. A trumpet in the Bible is used when announcing something. It's used as an instrument for war. It's used as an instrument to make certain things known. It's a very loud instrument. If any of you have ever bought a, a trumpet for your child to learn to play the trumpet, you'll understand what I mean. It's like a drum kit. It gives you a bit of a headache after a while. Now, the trumpets are the same thing. These are, are points where, where the Lord is trying to describe to us the heralding of a subject, the shouting of new information. So the seven trumpets are seven announcements and they take place before the Day of Atonement. Interestingly enough, you've got seven trumpets and you've got seven plagues. You've got seven trumpets that warn about the coming times. And you've got seven plagues that come post those warnings. The Lord never does anything unless he warns us about it and unless he heralds through some means of what's going to take place. The seven trumpets include number one, the earth, number two, the sea, number three, the rivers and the fountains, number four, the sun, the moon and the stars. These are different warnings about these things. Number five will be darkness, the bottomless pit and locusts. The sixth trumpet is is speaking about the river Euphrates. The seventh trumpet is loud voices and the kingdom of Christ. Let's compare it for a moment to the seven plagues. Number one, the first trumpet is warning about the earth. Interestingly enough, the first plague is on the earth. 
The second trumpet warns about the sea. The second plague is on the sea. The third trumpet is on the river, warns about the rivers and the fountains. The third plague hits the rivers and the fountains. The fourth one is the sun, the moon, and the stars. And the, fifth, the fourth plague describes the plague about the sun. The, the fifth one is darkness and the bottomless pit and lo locusts. This is the trumpet heralding this message. Guess what? The fifth plague is darkness on the throne of the beast. Now this has got to do with the mark of the beast. This has got to do with identifying the Antichrist. That's the very next lecture. Don't miss that. Because the Antichrist power is going to receive its own plague. The sixth heralding trumpet speaks about the river Euphrates. The sixth plague is on the river Euphrates. The seventh trumpet is the loud voices in the kingdom of Christ. And again, the seventh plague is a loud voice saying, it is done. Beautiful alignment between the, seven the trumpets and the seven plagues. Saying again, I won't do anything, my children, Jesus says. I won't do anything unless I've warned you about it. Revelation 8, verses 1 to 3. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God. And to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. This is speaking about the merit of Christ. In Revelation 8 verse 4 we read, And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Here in the Bible, in Revelation, God is referring us back into the tabernacle, back into the sanctuary. As you walked into the holy place, you had the three items. You had the table of showbread, you had the lamp stand with the seven candles, and then in front of you, you had the altar of incense. And the smoke would go up and over the curtain into the holy of holies. Here Jesus is saying the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints. You see, that smoke in the Holy of Holies represents the, the, the prayers of the people. And this is relayed in Revelation 8 verse 4. Let's read it again. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And again, this, this identify, the identification of pulling the sanctuary truth all the way throughout history is put together again right at the end of the Bible in Revelation 8 verse 4. 8 verse 5 says the following. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. This is the moment when Jesus says, it is done. It is now finished. The trumpets of Revelation go as follows. Revelation 8 verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail, fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Revelation 8 verse 7. Revelation 8 verse 8 and 9 read as follows. The second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire and cast into the sea and a third part of the sea became blood and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and a third part of the ships were destroyed. Very stern warning. The trumpet warns and the plagues arrive. And the third angel sounded. Revelation 8 verse 10 and 11. And the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The fourth angel sounds his trumpet in Revelation 8 verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Can you see how we are moving through these various time periods, and how things are starting to line up with the seven churches and the seven seals? The fourth angel, exactly spot on time. 
Now this darkness, as I explained earlier, the darkness when, when the sun is darkened and the moon is made red and the third part of the stars fall, this is a representation in Scripture of the dark ages when the truth which was supposed to be going into the world was shut down. Jesus says in John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And this is repeated in John 12, 46, when Jesus himself says, I am come a light into the world. And then possibly the most powerful and ominous warnings of all time, the last three trumpets. Revelation 8, verse 13 reads as follows. And I beheld a trumpet, an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. These three woes are associated with the next three trumpets and they imply an unprecedented increase in the demonic attack on the truth. Those last three periods become the time when Satan knows his time's coming to an end and he puts together a furious attack on the truth of God. From then onwards, the decline of true Christianity is rapid. Today, what we're going to be looking at in the next couple of lectures is how does this woe, this last woe that we're going to get to, how does that affect us? How's this woe affecting us in the, the last church of time? Where are the fingers of these secret powers hidden? How does this whole thing fit together? I'd like to ask you a question. Which powers displaced Bible-based Christianity? And which philosophies arose after the Dark Ages to, to dethrone Christ and deprive mankind of salvation? Which power in the world arose during that dark period? Well, number one, Islam replaced Christianity in the cradle of Judaism and Christianity. Number two, the age of rationalism and contemporary humanism replaced him in the West. Not many, under, not many people understand that the Humanist Manifesto, which is heralded today as such a wonderful document, the Humanist Manifesto has this quote on page 16. Go and read it. Go and look for it. Read it and you'll see it says there, No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. This is the, the coming in of this demonic and satanic attack on the truth. Woe, woe, woe. Revelation 9 verse 1 to 3. And the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. People often wonder, what are these locusts? How does this whole thing fit together? Well, the smoke coming out of the bottomless pit. Have you ever tried to drive through a felt fire before? Have you ever been on the highway where there's smoke crossing the highway? And you just carry on and go straight down the highway full speed? No, you slow down because you're not quite sure of yourself. It's like driving in the fog in the mists. Well, this is the same thing. This is the demonic uh, doctrines that are going to confuse people, are going to mislead people, are going to make them slow down in their ability to perceive and understand the truth. What about the locusts and what about the, the power that's given to them like scorpions? Well, John William Draper writes in his historical book, A History of the Intellectual Development of Europe, he says, four years after the death of Justinian, 571 AD, was born at Mecca in Arabia, the man who of all men has exercised the greatest influence upon the human race. This is continued in the book, The Life of Muhammad. This is continued, it says, Muhammad appeared on the scene at one of the darkest periods in all history when all civilizations from Merovingian Gaul to India were falling to ruin or were in a state of troubled gestation. 
This is the start of the rise of Islam. I speak to people that find themselves trying to spread the gospel today of Christianity in Islamic countries. If you speak to those people, you see that it's under duress by which they have to work. It is not an easy place to be. Revelation 9 continues in verse 4. And it was commanded to them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented, how long? Five months. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. We've always got to look inside the Bible and then we're going to look outside the Bible to see if this is all aligns up. Make sure that people are trying to pull the, aren't trying to pull the wool over your eyes and convince you into some sort of Christian dogma. You see, today we have to be cognitive and logical more than ever about our religious convictions. We cannot allow, to be, allow ourselves to be swept up by some emotional context. Let's look outside the Bible and see how this, this thing about people wanting to die and not being able to will happen. And how it was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing in Revelation 4 verse 6. What does that all mean? Well, you just need to go in history into the decree of Abu Bakr. This was Muhammad's uncle who succeeded him in what he was doing. The decree of Abu Bakr states the following. When you fight the battles of the Lord, acquit yourselves like men without turning your backs. But let not your victory be stained with the blood of women and our children. Destroy not the palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to the cattle. Only such as you will kill and eat. When you make any covenant or article, stand to it and be as good as your word. Isn't that amazing? The Bible says that it was commanded to them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, or nor any tree. The decree of Abu Bakr says exactly the same thing. Destroy not the palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Don't cut down any fruit trees. Fulfillment of prophecy? Absolutely. What about this period of five months? Well, in the Jewish period or in the time of the Bible, when you read the Bible, a month consi consisted of 30 days. So five months would be five times 30, which would be 150 days. Now, remember we take, according to Numbers in Ezekiel, we, when we're speaking prophetic language, we speak about taking one day for a year. Well, you take 150 days, it means prophetically 150 years. On July 27th, 1299, which is slap bang in the middle of Thyatira period, the fourth church in the middle. Uh, July 27, 1299, Otman I invaded Nicomedia. That's according to the historian E. Gibbons. Now, let's add 150 years onto July 27th, 1299. Work it out. What do you get? I get July 27th, 1449. Do you get the same? Well, the exact date of the 27th of July, 1449, is the exact date when the last of the Greek emperors, Constantine, took the throne by whom? The permission of the Sultan. According to Revelation, this is what would take place. According to history, this is what took place. Revelation 9, verse 11 and 12 continues. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Revelation 9 verse 13 and onwards. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. 
Here the Lord is describing some fantastical events, some magnanimous events, some events that have not happened in history before. This is Christ and Satan. Satan's army is numbered against God as 200,000 thousand. Do you remember the number of the people that are sealed by God? 144,000. That's the reason that Revelation speaks about, I heard the number of them. And if you've ever been in Africa or you've ever been and you've, you've heard either a, a group of people running or maybe a herd of buffalo running across the plain and you hear as this number comes, as this group moves, well, that's exactly what is being described here. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000. Thousand. This is a figure which is just unbelievable. People that were on Satan's behalf fighting, where 144,000 were on God's behalf. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which wast, and art to come. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. Here what we're looking at is the fulfillment of the rock hitting the feet of the statue. Here what we're looking at is the fulfillment of the seventh seal being opened. Here what we are looking at is the fulfillment of the seventh trumpet when Jesus returns to come and fetch his own. Like Revelation 1 verse 7 says with this beautiful graphic behind it. Behold, he cometh with the clouds and every eye will see him. And they also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. We've been discussing the seven churches, the seven seals and the seven trumpets. These are historical prophetic periods which have come from the time of Jesus right through to the time of his return. The seven churches are a specific message for the various eras of history. They are also a prophetic time period of when certain things are going to take place. And over and above that, they are a message to you and I of what we need to be wary of. Like today, about being lukewarm in that last church of Laodicea. The seven seals there, on the other hand, are a clearer depiction of the character of the religious convictions of those eras. Where the churches were more historical time periods, the seven seals start to explain to us how the people are going to react and feel towards God. The seven trumpets, on the other hand, increase our knowledge and our understanding of this demonic attack on Christianity. I... Hope that this has somehow given you insight into the, the depth of the knowledge inside Revelation. We haven't even scratched the surface of it yet. We've just flown 30,000 foot over the subject. And we're going to be looking now on the next lecture and onwards at putting all of this stuff. We've built a foundation. We're now going to put something on top of it. We've filled the airplane. We've trimmed the wings. And now we're going to take off. We've come down the left-hand side of the chiasm, all the way to the center, into the great controversy. I hope that you're going to have the courage to spend the next couple of lectures uncovering this truth about the demonic attack on Christianity. Thank you.